everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Martinsville Henry County Historical Society, I would like to welcome you to the Heritage Center and Museum. My name is Callie Heidela. I'm the museum's director of program development and administration. And I want to thank you all for being here with us today. Um, after today's speaker, uh, who I'll introduce in just a moment, uh, we'll hold a brief annual meeting of the membership right here in the courtroom, uh, which you're all invited and welcome to attend. Uh, you'll hear a bit about our finances, <coughs> and you'll be introduced to our newest board members and officers, and I promise you it won't be as boring as that sounds. <laughs> uh, if you aren't a member and of the Historical Society and you'd like to join us, there are membership forms downstairs at the welcome desk and uh, right outside that courtroom door. So we would absolutely love to have you as part of our historical society community. Uh, today's talk was organized in conjunction with a very special exhibit, Agents of Change, Female Activism in Virginia from Women's Suffrage to Today, on loan to us from the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond. It's on display in our gallery downstairs through June 5th, and we hope you'll take some time to visit it and read through the stories told there, and today, enjoy some light refreshments down in our conference room. Uh, the day before that exhibit closes, Friday, June the 4th, the Historical Society will be hosting an event called Uptown Open Mic and Virginia Wine Tasting, right outside in the plaza of our beautiful historic courthouse, and that's gonna be from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, the event is completely free to attend and it promises to be a lot of fun, There'll be a cash bar featuring Virginia wines and an open mic hosted by Kat and Dennis Calfee. So we invite you to bring a chair or a blanket and some cash for the bar uh, and an instrument if you play and join us if you can. And you can find out more information about that event on the museum's Facebook page or on our website. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank the Heritage Center and Museum's annual sponsors, the Lester Group and Carter Bank and Trust for their support of our institution and programs like Uptown Open Mic and the one you're about to enjoy today. And now it's time for the main event. Mary Sue Terry was Attorney General of Virginia from 1986 until 1993, and was the first woman ever elected to statewide office in Virginia. Delegate Jane Jones, a current candidate for Virginia's Attorney General, recently called her the most consequential and successful Attorney General that Virginia has ever seen. In 1993, Terry resigned as Attorney General to run for governor, making her Virginia's first female candidate for that office. Her accomplishments are numerous, and her legacy is an inspiring one. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mary Sue Terry. that I get my hearing aids on Thursday, so I might have to ask you to repeat yourself. Um, the topic that's been assigned to me today is a vast topic, and I want to approach it from the 30,000 foot level. And if I sound partisan, I can't discuss women's issues without being partisan. I can discuss a lot of issues without being partisan, but not women's issues. So I want to begin by dealing with stereotypes. And my assistant over here, Carrie, is going to help me. I want us to begin with you, and you all are, you all are the subject matter. I want us to begin with stereotypes for men. Come on, we're going to sit here till dark here. Yeah. What? Strong. Strong. Okay. What else? Brave. Assertive. What? Brave. Brave. Assertive. What else? Handy. 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 Handy man. What? <laughs> Handy man. <laughs> what else? Never ask for directions. <laughs> what? They never ask for directions. Would that be on your own side? Don't 
great problems. What issues are men most concerned about as a general rule?
say yeah. there's more left. Isn't that change? You can say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> they're more left. They're more. They. I think they're more democratic than they are conservative. And why would they be democratic? They'd like to control their own body. They would be the pollution. What else? That's the that's the the, the road that the, that the uh, Democratic Party follows. It's nurturing, uh, family caring. They're they're totally enveloped into the the family issue stuff. They're not right. best, they're not uh, military. Which gender is more risk averse? Risk averse. Oh, first. Oh, first. No, that would be female. Women, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they say that when folks headed west in those uh, wagons, Conestoga wagons, that women resisted. They were afraid of the un unknown. And if there was a household vote, it would be a tie. And yet, if men had not persevered and taken the risk, our country would be in a vastly different place. So risk is not bad, but it's got to be calculated. Now, so can, by these stereotypes, you project whether there are more men or women in the Congress of the United States. <laughs> Somebody say that loud. Men. More men. men. Yeah, in the Senate and in the House. In fact, in Congress, roughly 30% of the Congress is constituted by women. What percentage of the population do women have? 51. 51. Now, in local boards, um, let's say school boards, which I think is one of the best avenues for a woman to get into politics, when you found an elected school board, with school boards, 60% of members of school boards nationally are white males with family incomes in excess of $100,000. And we wonder why there's often a disconnect between folks and conflict between folks who look at, at education. Now, so let's look, and this is not a partisan statement, but if we look at the infrastructure package of the president, what is the most controversial provision in that package? Healthcare? Yeah, it's, it's healthcare and, and providing childcare for women so they can go to work. Now think about it this way. That may sound like they sound weird. Why is child care in an infrastructure bill for roads, bridges, water pipes, broadband, which we really need? Well, when you think about it, roads help us get to work, right? Child care helps who get to work? Mm -hmm. Women. Women. And so it's recommended to be part of the infrastructure package because it facilitates when there's child care, women can get back to the labor force. And by the way, we're supposed to have equal pay, but women make 77 cents on the dollar, what men make. And when women leave the workforce for child rearing purposes, which is wonderfully important, they get behind when they go back in. And that's one of the reasons that, that there's a salary disparity. But, you know, when we think of this big picture, 
when I think of this big picture. What it motivates me to do is to encourage women to run for office, whether it's for the school board, which is a good place to start, or board of supervisors, to develop a resume, to go to Richmond. It was the Democrats in Richmond who passed Medicaid for Virginians. I think that created 500,000 500, families that now have health care. So we just can't take for granted sitting here and having this one-way conversation. We just can't take for granted our responsibility as women to support women. Now, how do you do that? Well, number one, you, you see somebody out there who has the characteristics of a leader, and that's not gender tied, who cares about people, who's got good interpersonal skills, and we get behind and encourage that person to run for office. And we say to that person, we'll be there for you, and we'll work for them, and we'll contribute to them. You know, there's something wrong in this country when, a women, when women have a majority of the wealth, they do, and a majority of the population that we're in the situation we're in. Let's say, for example, there's a lot of talk about UFOs these days, but let's say that a UFO stayed here long enough to observe our situation. And he noticed that a minority of one gender has most of the power. And the majority is basically second class. Now, and you gave them a multiple choice test. And you said, what do you think, and what do you think type of government is this? They certainly wouldn't pick democracy, would they? Why would they pick democracy when this underclass has a majority of the votes? Makes no sense, does it? Think about it. I don't know what they would pick. It might be autocracy, if you talk totalitarianism. I don't know. But there's something wrong with this picture. When women who will constitute uh, the most folks in poverty, women who have the most needs in so many different areas, have a majority of the wealth and a majority of the population, what that tells me is somebody is passive. Do you all understand what I mean by that? It tells me that most of the gender is passive. Now let's look what might be the root of that. Almost a hundred years ago, a man could beat his wife with impunity. Um, prior to that, women weren't, weren't allowed to hold property. They couldn't vote. And so there's something that gets ingrained in them, just like ingrained in a child who's in a family that's real top down. To, at a subconscious level, to feel like they're not powerful. Y'all get me? Who are they? Um, who are they that can step up? They haven't been reared to step up their whole lives. And to tell you the truth, and I'm at New Divinity School, the church hasn't helped in that, has it? Has the church helped in that? Shy away from it. Yeah, and the stereotypes in the church and the selective uh, 
the selective use of scriptures. But when you think about Jesus, Jesus never talked down to a woman. He had women with him and his disciples up until the time of his crucifixion. He entrusted a woman, uh, Mary, Mary, there were two Marys, but he entrusted a woman when he had risen from the dead, think about this, to go tell his disciples that he had, was risen. Now does that sound like a Lord that doesn't value women, that doesn't trust women, Jesus never talked down to women. He never disparaged women. And, and some of the women could have been in a real bad place, like the woman at the well. He told her her life. But he said, go and sin no more. So, while people can pull snippets of the Bible, They cannot pull a situation, not one, from the life of Jesus that would support the proposition that a woman is second class. Not one. So, where are we now? We're in a tough place. And I don't need to tell you that. about you, but I'm terribly concerned, even frightened, about the prospect of our holding on to democracy in this country. Now, there are two choices here. Democracy where everybody's equal and everybody can vote, or what? authoritarianism where there's a top down. Do you all get me? And within this context there are these enormous needs. You've just named some of them. So if we just leave here today and you all say, well that was interesting. My time's, your time's been wasted and so is mine. I'm here to encourage you to do something perhaps some of you have never done. And that is step up. Step up. And if there's a seat open on the school board, find somebody and support them to run. When, this is a situation, you all mentioned power. Women do not gravitate toward power, which is a good thing in my judgment. And studies show that women will often say to themselves, well, I just don't feel qualified. I have a younger sister and daddy didn't want her to keep going in graduate school and education. She wanted to be a principal. And he would say, he said, I just don't think you, he, he didn't want me to go to law school either. Uh, he said, I don't want you to be a principal. I just don't think you can handle it. So what she said was, Daddy, do you think I'd be as good as so-and-so? Well, I guess so. And that ended the conversation. So with the women, the, you have, the women are instinctively insecure about their qualifications, but that does not mean they're, they're unqualified. Do you get me? When you're considering running for an office, you ask yourself, do I think I could do a better job with my values than the person 
on the other side. When I first ran for Attorney General in 1985, well, actually, when I first ran for the House of Delegates in 1977, uh, I was 29, and then I, when I was elected, I was 30. And the only way I got elected was she loved me. I went to every country store, and this was the key, I went to every fire department because I figured if those firemen could get to know me and call me Mary Sue as opposed to that woman, they might consider voting for me. So it was shoe leather. It was reaching out, getting to know people, moving beyond the stereotype of that woman up in Patrick County. You see what I'm saying? And, and yeah, who encouraged you to do that? To run? Um, I was in a, I was assistant commonwealth attorney with Martin Clark. There was a vacancy coming up, and uh, I thought he was going to run. He went to Richmond. I thought, and, and I was going to be commonwealth attorney. And he came back from Richmond, and one afternoon he called me in his office. He said, Mary Sue, I've decided. I don't want to run for the House of Delegates just so one day they can put it on my tombstone. And every office I've ever run for, I didn't run for it because I wanted it on my tombstone. He said, I will back you. Um, and, um, you know, you may be able to make it. Well, Patrick only had 17,000 people. The district, we were the smallest county. And, but I worked hard. And after a while, people started saying, she works hard. But these folks who think they can run for office, send out a letter for a fundraiser, that never works. I had to call people to get money. And when I positioned to run for attorney general, I was told, that my money would be matched around Virginia, in Northern Virginia, Richmond, and Tidewater, by what I could raise down here. Well, not being a person of independent wealth, I went to work. And I knew that I could not, and it's the good housekeeping um, concept of fundraising. You gotta get 80% of your money from 20% of your people. So, I knew to raise a million dollars, which was twice what had ever been raised before, before an election. I was gonna to have to have what I call flagships. I was gonna to have to have $5,000 contributors. From Martinsville, the first people I sat down with were Bill and Carolyn Frank, and we were down here in a restaurant on 220. I explained to them why I was running I explained to them the plan. I explained to them why I was running. And, and that I really needed, um, hoped they would be a flagship. That was my nomenclature. The only other contact I had had with the Franks, for whom I had enormous admiration, was when I represented a woman who had broken into their summer home up in Patrick County. Uh, but anyway, we were sitting there, and Bill Frank said, would, would you take more than that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, certainly. I thanked him and I left. Well, the next thing I knew, I was getting a check for $15,000. So then, I went to uh, Dudley Walker, who just died, because that example, when I got 5,000 from him, I went to, God, who's the, Lacey, I mean, who was the, Frank. Huh? Frank. Frank Lacey. No, his, Panel? Huh? Bill Panel. Oh, Bill Panel. Yeah. I went to Bill Panel. And if y'all ever had a chance to meet Bill, Bill Panel. Oh, you want me to be one of your flagships? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, Bill, I need you to be a flagship. Well, I reckon I can. So in those 
three meetings, I had pulled together $25,000. And this was a year and a half before the election. So then I went for the next tier and sat down with people to get a thousand. Because this is a trick. If somebody who's known to be real wealthy doesn't give you a certain amount, and you go to somebody who's, who's not as wealthy and ask them for a thousand when this other guy only gave you a thousand, you're in a bad place. So I visited and visited and visited. I knew the only way I could win would be to could run was be to raise this unprecedented amount of money. And we ended up having an event at Stonely. Chuck Rob was there. Planes flew in from the coal fields, Richmond, Northern Virginia, and Tyler. I raised, we raised seventy-five thousand dollars from here. Money's here. And I, I never, I never resented raising money because I looked at the goal. The only way I could win and try to make a difference for Virginia was I had to have money. And I never, I, you know, I, it takes a lot of work. So that's how. I don't know where I got off on that tangent, but that's where. <laughs> huh? That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, what I'm saying is, you have to lay the foundation. There, there are people running for governor and lieutenant governor that started last fall. Well, first of all, you got to get to know people. You got to get. I, I started over two years before. Because I not only had to raise money, but I had to be party people. And because of that effort, the person who I'd raised over $225,000 the year of the election in January, there was somebody thinking of running, but I'd already wiped them out in terms of fundraising. And I never had opposition to the nomination as Attorney General. I never had opposition to the nomination the second time, and I never had opposition for governor. But I worked hard. And you just can't sit in, in a phone booth, sit in a phone, and call people and make cold calls and ask for money. So I say this as an encouragement. You've just got to get out there and work hard. And women have women know all about working hard, don't you? You know about working hard, don't you? When I was hiring lawyers for my office, the, the Attorney General's office, there were about 175 lawyers in that office. And at one time I had to call in a, an attorney because he was ugly than secretaries. And I said, you just need to know that I can replace you a lot easier than I can replace her. Because she was a good secretary. Lawyers were out there. But anyway, I would, I would tell a lawyer, I said, I want you to know one thing. I don't care what law school you went to. I don't care what grades you made or whether you were in um, law review. I care about common sense and I care about interpersonal skills. And when is the Attorney General, the opinions would come to my desk, and there are volumes of my opinions out there, I would look at the question, then I would look at the answer. Now, at the bottom, they have the conclusion. And if I disagreed with the conclusion, I would send it back to the lawyers and say, you've got to reach this, and yes, ma'am, this is what the law is. So then what I would do is I would drop a footnote and, and say, the legislature may want to look at this statute for a different result. Um, common sense, interpersonal skills. 
And the last thing I will say is listening. If you look at a good television ad of a candidate, that candidate will be listening, not talking. Okay, I'm going to stop. If that's okay, and you all can, you know, if you want to comment back. Or Who did you run against for governor? Uh, George Allen. It was a bad, bad year for Democrats. Um, number one, Doug Wilder was in the, in the pit in the pits, and he. Well, I'm, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Bill Clinton was poll numbers were way low, and so for the first time in recent years, I could I could not bring in the president to campaign for me. I was close with Al Gore. He wasn't controversial, but if I brought in Al Gore, they were going to say, why didn't you bring in the president? And the president did want to come in, but, you know, all I needed at that point was a picture with him, and that would have been all she wrote. And I admired him, and I admired Hillary, but that just wasn't going to work. Um, so it was a bad climate. All the, the best way I can describe it is you can plan an outdoor wedding and you can have everything set up beautifully, but if it rains, you're not gonna have an outdoor wedding. The same in politics. If the climate is bad, you're going against the wind. And the climate could not have been worse in my race. So that's just the way it is. But I think that they'll, I think there'll be more sincere mourners at my funeral because I lost. <laughs> Why did you never run again? Well, I lost pretty badly. I would have liked to have run again for something to show I could win um, in, a, in a different climate, but the one thing I, I, I declared when I first ran for office is I would never have a debt at the end. And I didn't have a debt. So I could move on and then shortly thereafter I was, and I got, I got search firms, you know, coming at me. Um, but I wasn't interested in leaving Virginia. Uh, I wasn't interested in being a college president to deal with the board of trustees. That didn't feel good to me. Um, and so I was at the University of Richmond for a number of years. I had a home there, did some law on the side, and, and I had a dog named Lady who was just my best friend. She was a German Shepherd rescue dog. And my house was on a small lot. And for me to give her exercise and get her off the leash, I'd have to drive 20 miles out of town to get her off the leash to pitch the tennis ball. I looked for a house with larger lots in Richmond, but I couldn't afford it. And finally, I said, Mercy, what's wrong with you? You got this farm in Patrick County. You don't have to put her on a leash. You don't have to drive all this way. Your parents' house is empty. So I asked my sister, Sally Ann lives on the farm, who's former principal of Spencer County. I said, Sally Ann, how do you think about my moving back to the farm? And she said, Mary Sue, what are you gonna do about a bathroom? I mean, the house did have plumbing. What are you gonna do about a bathroom and a church? My bathroom in Richmond was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Jacuzzi, you know. You sit there and look out the window. I mean, it was really nice. Um, and I still have the same two bathrooms that mom and daddy had, but that becomes less important. Church has been uh, a little, little different. Um, I'm sort of more charismatic than a lot of the churches around here, because that's a tradition of anyone. So, yes, ma'am. Um, what advice would you give to those who are running for the market and not going to college? Um, I would give advice to 
get involved with your local Democratic committee. Let them see you as a worker bee. You gotta be a worker bee. Um, that's what I was. I mean, I was, I was supporting Dan Daniel and others when I was building fair boots, doing all that stuff, all the way up. And once you once you're known as a worker bee, then they give you more and more responsibility, and they get to know you, and if they can trust you. Okay, Fran. The tangent that you went on about getting money, um, I saw in that that you had confidence in yourself, which a lot of us don't have, and also you asked for what you needed, which a lot of us don't do. Well, you, you know, I had a goal. I believed I could make a difference that was necessary to be made, okay? So, if I, it's just like, I uh, didn't want to go to law school, but if I didn't go, I couldn't be a lawyer. So I had went through all that pain. So if, if, if you think you can make a difference and the difference is needed and you're the one to make it, so then how do you get there? You raise money and you develop the capacity because you believe you believe that you're the best person for the job. And see, that's one of the things where women, uh, the whole notion of self-confidence and being able to eyeball somebody to ask for money, that's where there's gotta be a lot of self-talk. A lot of self-talk. And I always like to raise money by myself with somebody. I never liked, I thought like the relationship could be more intimate. And, you know, and I explained my plan. I explained why I was running. This is what I wanted to do. Um, and y'all go off the record with this, please. Years ago, when Chuck Bob was thinking about running for governor, was going to run for governor, there was a conference call. And they said, why do you want to be governor? He couldn't answer the question. You know, he had, in other words, you have this inchoate desire you want to do something, but you got to be concrete. Now, he was elected governor. He got over me. He learned he had to come up with why he wanted to be governor. And if you believe, that you, you believe that a difference is necessary and you believe that you can make that difference, then you can eyeball something and, and you come up with a fundraising plan You'll find it. You'll find that it's enjoyable. It's enjoyable because every time you get another whatever, you're that much closer to your goal. You have to keep your eye on why you're running, the difference that needs to be made, and and that you're the best person to make it. So it's self-talk, and that's the reason, my friends that it's important for, for people to circle around a, a woman who might be interested and provide that support and encouragement. Women, a woman will, women down here will never step out on their own. They need encouragement. I had, I had a broker, I had somebody Every, every woman, because women aren't motivated by power. They're motivated by making a difference. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing I have, one of my goals in running for statewide office was encouraging women to open their checkbooks. Now, I want you to think about this. Women will give to a museum They'll give to a not for profit. They'll give to all of these things, and do they wish to have their money, their names up in lights? As a general rule, no. How many buildings around here are named for them? 
that's not their motivation. But when, when you approach a man to give money, they want, in, as a general, and this isn't a bad thing, they want influence, they want to, you know, they, they, they have, they don't always have an agenda, but they, they are not as averse to seeing their name out there with a large contribution. You see what I'm saying? Because their motivation is generally, and I'm not saying that Bill and Carolyn Frank had a bad motivation, and I don't think that Phil Panel, he didn't give a rip, you know? I mean, he just, <laughs> he just said he would be my flagship. But um, Doug, and Wal Doug and Walker never called me for anything. But as a general rule, if you ask a woman of means to open her checkbook and write a check for $5,000 or whatever, I mean, they're in shock. Now this may sound, my goal when I ran for governor, because we don't have campaign contribution, contribution limits and not many people Yes, I wanted to get five women to commit to giving a hundred thousand dollars a piece. Why is that? I wanted my campaign to be anchored financially in women. Could I do that? And, and I didn't approach anybody that couldn't write a check for much more. But the reluctance was having their name out. They could write a check from the Virginia Museum of History or whatever over here, but they they just, they didn't want the publicity or from their, their standpoint, the notoriety. So that's another, that's another thing that women have to deal with. But whoever, you all, you know, the next time an not with us, board of supervisors or school board, some of you need to caucus and you need to think of somebody that you really think would be good and you need to surround that person and tell them you'll be with them. Do you all understand? Shake your head up and down. <laughs> that you need to be with them, that you'll work for them and you'll expand the network. And that's the way to make a difference. It's the only way. You know, the problem is getting somebody to run, you know, getting them motivated, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, you know, we loved you and we, just like A.L. Philpott or Virgil Good, they were such an influence on this area and we, we miss that. Yeah, we do. And it takes, you know, it takes, it takes. Well, it, it's like Mary Jordan at the Spencer Penn Summit. She was wonderful. And she can motivate people better than anybody. And I wish we had people like that running for office. Yep. But there are, other, there are people in this room that could run for office. Do you still have diplomatic immunity? <laughs> Maybe you could shoot some of our leaders. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just joking. <laughs> politics, I never had immunity from anything. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't have, I don't have a watch, but I don't want to believe this. And there are refreshments downstairs. <laughs> well, we five to one. four. What? It's five to four. Okay, I think this is about long enough, don't you? Let me just encourage you all, don't make my, please don't make my visit down here in vain. Okay? Fair enough. All right.